Good afternoon. I'd like to ask everyone to please find a seat. So hello, I'm Bryna Krah, and I'm president of the AMS uh, currently. And it's my real pleasure to introduce Ruth Charney, um, who is giving her retiring presidential address, having just completed being president, well, 11 months ago, approximately. Um, Ruth is the Theodore and Evelyn uh, Berenson Professor of Mathematics at Brandeis University and is well known for her work in geometric group theory and in topology. She has won numerous awards, including election as Fellow of the AMS, of course, in its inaugural class in 2012, and as a Fellow of the Association for Women in Mathematics in its inaugural class in 2017. She's had numerous doctoral students, over 15, and is a frequent in, in frequently in demand around the world as a lecturer and a collaborator. In addition to all of her research, she has tirelessly served the profession, including numerous leadership roles, not just as president of the AMS, but she was also previously president of the Association for Women in Mathematics in 2013 to 15, and previously had served in the AMS in numerous roles, um, as the council of the AMS on the council, as a vice president of the society, on the board of trustees, and of course, most recently as president. So please join me in welcoming Ruth. Greetings, everyone. Um, it's been a real honor serving as president and now past president of the American Mathematical Society. Um, I've actually been involved with the AMS for a large part of my career in various forms. And um, the, more I've, the more I've gotten to know the society, the more amazed I've been at how, much, how many different things they do and how many different ways they serve the mathematical community. Um, so I, I would encourage you, if you aren't already, to get involved with either the AMS or whatever um, professional society you feel most connected to. Um, I think it's not only a way to serve your community, but also um, a way to meet new people and build your own network. So I'm, as, as you can tell from Bryna's introduction, I'm a, I'm, I'm a big fan of professional societies. So um, get involved. Um, okay, so, uh, but my talk um, today is um, not about the AMS. It's about um, um, an area of mathematics that's, that has intrigued me throughout my career. And recently, there, it's been really taken off and gotten very exciting th thanks to some new techniques that have been developed to answer some longstanding questions. So that's what I'm gonna tell you about today. Um, and um, I want to begin with a little bit of, uh, <clears throat> a little bit of, can you hear me here? Yes, good. Okay, so I want to begin with a little bit of background and context. Okay, so I started out my career um, as an algebraic topologist, K-theory and algebraic topology. Well, what's that? Well, algebraic topology, you start with a topological space, and you try to understand it by associating certain group certain algebraic objects to the space, like the homotopy groups, or homology groups, or cohomology groups. And then you study the space, or you compare two different spaces, by looking at these algebraic structures that you've associated to, to them, okay? The field I'm involved in now, which um, appeared really uh, in, the, in the 1990s, is a relatively new field, we generally call geometric group theory. And what that is, is it kind of goes the other direction. You start out with some group you're trying to understand that has been maybe is very abstract or comes to, uh, to you from, you know, some, from some algebraic structure. And the way we study these groups is by associating a topological space, or more precisely a metric space, that the group acts on by isometries. It preserves the geometry. And then we study the geometry to learn about the group. We, we, we want to use properties of the, ge of the geometry to tell us about the group. 
So that's kind of the context that this is, um, goes in. And as I said, that's called geometric group theory. And I thought what I wanted to tell you about today was some of the, the how we've used geometric group theory to study a class of groups called Artin groups, um, which is a very big and I think very fascinating class of groups. So the talk sort of has three parts. I'm going to start by telling you what are Artin groups, what, what these groups are. And then I will um, we'll discuss a little bit what we do and don't know about art and groups, because there are some very long-standing open problems in, um, about art and groups. And finally, hopefully I'll have time to tell you a little bit about how we're using geometric group theory to try and understand these groups better and to solve some of these problems. So, so that's my goal for today. OK, so let's get started. We have to get this to go forward. How about that? There we go. Um, OK, so rather than start with the general definition of an Artin group, I want to start with a special, a particular Artin group that, that, ten that a lot of people have encountered and that is easy to describe, namely braid groups. OK, so braid groups are an example of Artin groups. So what's a braid group? Well, I'm going to give you several different ways to think about braid groups. So um, the first is just pictorially. So what's a braid? Well, we have some strings, you know, and are, they're attached at some, say we have end points, like the one I've drawn is four point, the, the braid group with four strings, okay? And then we braid them. We let them intertwine, whatever, and then we reconnect them at the bottom at the same, in the, in the, sa the same set of points, okay? That's an element of the braid group, is one of those pictures. Well, to be a group, we have to have a, some kind of multiplication, some kind of um, operation between two braids. So I have two braids, what do I do? Well, I simply take the first one, uh, the second one, and attach it at the bottom of the first one to make a longer braid, which sees the, the say in this case, the red braid followed by the, by the blue braid, okay? And that gives me a new braid, and that's my multiplication. Okay, so pictorially, that's what braid groups are. Braid group on n strands, in this case, four strands. All right. Um, that's not um, a, a sufficiently formal definition to work with. It's a nice way to think about them, but we need something a little more concrete, all right? So let's move on to a, a sort of algebraic description, namely a presentation for the group. So a presentation for the group is a set of generators together with certain equations that these generators satisfy, all right? So what's the generators? Well, I could do any braid at any given moment. I'm always crossing one string over whatever string is next to it, all right? It's a series of crossing strings over, uh, over or under um, whatever's next to it. And so my generators are um, um, si is cross the ith string over the i plus first string, all right? And I can write every braid as a product of, of these si's, okay? What kind of relations do they satisfy? Well, if, if the strings I'm crossing, if I have two, an SI and an SJ, and they're not next to each other, then you know what? It really doesn't matter which one I cross over, over with the other one. I didn't explain this to you, but we consider two braids to be the same if you can, if they're so-called isotopic, namely you can change one picture into the other picture without, de without passing anything through anything else and without disconnecting the, the bottom. If I can just, you know, just move this string over a little and, you're, you're, you know, and get, and it's the same thing. Okay, so, it, so if it, SI and SJ, if they're not next to each other, doesn't matter which, which one I do first. I really get the same picture. So they commute. So one of my um, relations is SI, SJ equals SJ, SI, providing I and J are not adjacent, or providing they're not, not adjacent. What if they are adjacent? Well, if they are adjacent, for example, if you do S1 times S2, that's not equal to S2 times S1. You can draw the picture and you see it's just not true. But it turns out if I do S1, S2, S1 versus S2, S1, S2, so that picture on the left and on the right there, those two are isotopic. You simply sort of, it's a, just a question of whether you cross those middle things before or after you go under that under that thing on front. They're isotopic. They're, they're really the same braid, okay? Okay, so we've got these two um, relations, types of relations, and it turns out that that's it. That's all you need to describe when two braids are equal, all right? Every braid can be written as a product of these generators, and any two braids that are isotopic can be, um, we, can, we can adjust our picture using just these two kinds of relations, okay? 
all right? So at the bottom there, I've written out the presentation, right? Generators S1 through Sn minus one, and two types of relations, right? So that's a formal algebraic definition of a braid group. All right, let's, um, oh, before we move on to the uh, geometric description, um, I wanna make an observation. So it turns out um, that break groups are very closely related to some other groups that everybody is familiar with, namely symmetric groups. So how does that work? Well, supposing we don't worry about whether we're crossing over or under, all right? We draw our picture, but we don't specify whether the you know, left, left string's going over the right string or vice versa. That's equivalent to saying that SI equals SI inverse that we don't care over, under, doesn't matter, or equivalently that SI squared is the identity, all right? So if we do that, if we add a relation that says SI squared equals one, or equivalently SI equals SI inverse, then all we care, all we see in our braid is where things end up. We don't really care exactly how they crossed over. All that remains um, from the picture is where does string one end up? Oh, it ends up in the third place. And where does string two end up? Oh, it ends up in the second place, et cetera. So what we get is a permutation of, of, the, of, the, of, the, initial, of the initial starting points. Okay, so it turns out by just adding this one other relation, SI squared equals one, the braid group turns into the symmetric group. All right, we get, we get um, um, a presentation for the symmetric group. All right, let's move on. That's gonna be important, what comes up next. Okay, now I wanna give you a third way of thinking about braid groups. All right, and this one's important, geometric. So um, first of all, let me tell, tell you what a configuration space is. So supposing I have a topological space, and just, you know, because it's fun to think about, think about it representing something like a factory floor. It's the, it's the layout of the factory floor, okay? And, and um, it's describing some space that, and I want, and I have a bunch of robots, and I wanna program them to move around in this space, all right? So I have N robots, and I'm gonna tell them that, you, you know, you need to do this job, you're gonna start here in the morning, and then you're gonna go over here and do this, and then you go over here and do this. But I have to be careful when I program them, if I have these N robots running around, that they're never in the same place at the same time, right? I don't want them to run into each other. So what I want is at every point in time that they are in N distinct points in X, that I ne they're ne never have two of them in the same point in X, okay? So the configuration space is all the allowable positions of the robot, which means N points in my space, X1 through Xn, such that no two are equal. Yeah, everybody get, got that? And you're not allowed to put two robots in the, same, in the same spot, all right? That's called the configuration space of N points in this space X, the factory floor, or whatever it is, all right? Now, it, um, now, I, okay, so now I can program my robots to move around. Well, that means what I'm looking for is a path in this configuration space, right? The programming of the robots is setting out a path in the configuration space. And let's just suppose that we want the, ro the robots have, you know, some place sort of stations that they start out, and at the beginning of the day they start there, and at the end of the day they end up in the same set of, in the same set of positions, all right? Guess what we see if we do that? Well, let's take a simple example. I can't really draw a factory floor. Let's take a simple example where X is just a disk, all right? A disk or even the whole plane. So my factory floor is wide open, you know, it's just a big open space, all right? What am I gonna see? Well, they start out at, at, at some initial points. They move around during the day, but they're not allowed to run into each other, and they end up at the same set of points. Guess what we've got? A braid, okay? So what are we, what are we saying then? That's, what's another way to say that? Another way to say that is the braid group is, what I've drawn is a loop, a loop. They start out in one place and they end up in the, in the same place. A loop in my configuration space. Well, oops, not quite, because I'm not gonna require, I'm gonna require that they end up in the same set of points, but I don't care if this one ends up in, you know, robot A ro ends up in robot B's spot and robot, you know, I don't actually care what order as long as they end up same set of points. So I've actually kind of modded out by this symmetric group by, simply means 
ignore the, the order of the robots. All we care is that they're, uh, the set of robots ends up in the same place, okay? So the break group can be thought of as the fundamental group of this configuration space, modular symmetric group, okay? So now, what have we got? Well, we've got three ways to think about braid groups, right? The first was just this sort of abstract pictures of strings that crossed each other, right? The second was algebraically as a presentation. And the third is geometrically as the fundamental group of some configuration space, okay, of some geometric construct. Okay, so um, braid groups, I don't have time to, I mean, I wanna move on, we don't have all, all I don't have, wanna spend my whole hour on braid groups, but let me just say they've played a big role in all kinds of areas, um, low dimensional topology, algebraic geometry, um, um, combinatorics, they, they show up all over the place. Um, but um, my goal today is to tell you about a much larger class of groups of which braid groups are just one example. Okay, so we're gonna move on now to a class of groups called Artin groups. And I just wanna mention some people prefer to call them Artin Titz groups. And the reason is that Jacques Titz was really the one who de originally developed the theory of, of general, general Artin groups. And I, I just wanna give him a nod for, you know, he's really the one who developed this, this, um, these ideas. Um, okay, so what is it? Well, um, I'd like to give you three descriptions of art and groups, but unfortunately there's not an easy pictorial one. There's no analog of the strings crossing each other. But there are nice analogs of the, of the algebraic and geometric descriptions, all right? So we're going to, that's, that's how I'm gonna define them, okay? So um, um, let's start with a presentation, so the algebraic description of these. Okay, so again, we have some finite set of generators, okay? and Remember, we had relations that were, that said, um, the relations for the braid groups, if you go back, was that some alternating product like S1, S2, S1 equals the opposite alternating product, S1, S2, S1, S2, S1 equals S2, S1, S2, and the op opposite um, thing. So the two um, products on each side are the same length, it's just a question of whether they start with S1. One or S2, right? Okay. So we're gonna allow any relation, by the way, the um, commuting relation is also of that form. S1, S2 equals S2, S1. It's just a length two one. All right, so that's the relations we're gonna allow. We're gonna allow, the, it's an alternating product on one side equals the alternating product of the same length on the other side, but we don't care what that length is. For any SI and SJ, I can give you an integer MIJ and tell you to write the product of that length, of length MIJ on each side, all right? That in fact, I can give, I can, if I want, I can say mij equal infinity. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means there is no relation there. Just don't, don't even put it in there. So, so, but I'm allowed to declare no relation at all between, between two generators. And, and to do that, I just say mij equals infinity. Okay? All right. So, um, break groups are an example, but obviously there are many, many, many other examples because I can um, just, take my MIJs to be anything I want them to be, any integer whatsoever or infinity. Um, and to specify, when we want to describe a particular Artin group, um, we usually encode that information rather than write out, I mean, if you have a lot of generators and a lot of relations, it takes a, it takes a long time to write, I mean, you don't wanna have to write out all those relations. So rather than write them all out, we usually encode this information in a graph, I'm gonna call it gamma, this graph. And the graph consists of one vertex for each generator, S1, S2, S3, S4, right? So those are the vertices. And then I put an edge between two vertices if Mij is not infinity. If it's infinity, there's no edge. If it's not infinity, I put an edge and I write Mij on that edge. I label the edge Mij just to remember what the, what the relation is. So it's just a shorthand way of writing out the presentation, all right? So let's look at an example. All right, my first example, here is um, I'm taking my um, gamma, the thing that encodes my presentation, to be a triangle. So I have three generators, S1, S2, and S3. And I'm gonna write three, two of the edges are labeled three and one of the edges labeled two. All right, well, guess what? Those three ones are those braid relations we saw before and those two ones is a commutator. Well, 
you can, if you go back and look at the definition of the, uh, uh, the braid group, you'll see that this is exactly the presentation for the braid group on four strands. So S1 is across the first two, S2 is across the next two, and S3 is across the next two, and this is exactly the braid group, all right? Okay, so, um, but there's lots of other things I could do. Let's try this last one, um, this uh, the example number two. So in this case, I also have three generators, but now I'm going to connect S1 and S2 by an edge labeled two, which means what? It means they commute, it means those two commute, S1, S2 equals S2, S1, and no edge connecting the third one. What does that mean? That means no relation between S3 and the other two generators. So what have I got? Well, S1, S2 generate a Z2, a, a Z cross Z, and then that other generator is a free product with that. There's no relation between the S3 generator and the other stuff. Okay, so just, just, just the point is we can do all kinds of crazy things by, by drawing different graphs and labeling them and labeling these edges. We can get all kinds of stuff. We'll see one or two more in, in a bit. Okay, so that's the, that's the um, definition of an Artin group in terms of presentations. Um, before we move on to the geometric thing, what if we do what we did with the um, um, braid group and add this extra relation, SI squared, SI equals SI inverse, or SI squared equals one. All right, well, if we do that, we get some other group, I just, you know, but it turns out that if you, if SI equals SI inverse, you could take that relation and take the right-hand side and multiply everything by the inverse of that and shove everything onto the left-hand side. And that relation, um, that alternating SI, SJ, SI, blah, 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 blah relation turns into the relation SI, SJ raised to the MIJ power equals one. Well, it, it, if you've never seen this before, you probably don't care, and it's not a big deal, but if you've ever encountered Coxeter groups, you, you'll recognize this as a, a well-known group called a Coxeter group, okay? So well, Coxeter groups are much studied class of groups that um, are interesting in their own right. I'm not gonna talk about them a lot. I just wanna say that Artin groups to every Artin group is associated to a Coxeter group, to every Coxeter group is associated to Artin group, and these two um, classes of groups are, are very closely interrelated, all right? It's like the Bray group and the symmetric group, okay? That's the idea. Okay, so in fact, we will use this. Um, yeah, what are we gonna do with this? Oh no, I want to give you another example. Right, 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 before we move on, let's look at the example. Well, first, I start with the two examples I had above. All right, so the first one was the Bray group, and we already know that if we get SI, equals, uh, SI squared equals one, we get the symmetric group, so that one we already know. All right, how about this other weirdo one I did, where we had um, the uh, Artin group was Z squared, free product Z. Well, nothing much has happened other than the fact that the Zs, the Zs were the came from the generators, S1, S2, S3, they've now become order two, so what's happened is instead of having Z cross Z, free product with Z, I have Z mod two cross Z mod two, free product with Z mod two. Nothing surprising, but, but there it is. By the way, this, is, um, this example is a special case of something called the right angled Artin group, which I'm really not gonna talk about. They, they are sort of a theory in and of themselves, and some of you may have heard of them, but they're not something I'm gonna focus on in this, in this talk. Um, okay, I thought I'd give you one more, because there are some really, um, things get weird. <laughs> I mean, those two were easy that I gave you in the first. Um, let's, let's move up to one that's um, known as a Euclidean Artin group, the Euclidean Coxeter group, because things start getting tricky when you get to these. So in this one, I took the same generators, S1, S2, S3, um, just like the Bray group, but I put threes on, every, on, on everything now. Well, it turns out um, the Coxeter group, the, the Artin group's hard to describe. Let me begin by describing the the, uh, not the Artin group, but the Coxeter group, because that's something we can picture, all right? So in the, for the Coxeter group, each generator can be thought of as a reflection of the plane, all right? Order two, you reflect across some line, you reflect again, you're back where you started, right? So we can realize the Coxeter group, we, we can realize the generators as reflections, and in this case, what we wanna do is take a um, equilateral triangle in the plane, and reflect across the lines that make up the sides of that, uh, of that triangle, all right? So you can check 
that um, that satisfies the relations we want. If you, if you reflect across two of these that, that cross, the, the net, the net what, what happens when you do reflection, reflection, you get a rotation, and it's rotation of order three. So you get this, you get this um, relation. So it turns out that you can absolutely picture the Coxeter group. The elements of the Coxeter group are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the um, triangles in a tiling of the plane. I mean, I can just literally picture this, that I can get from the, so my base triangle to anywhere else by a series of these, of these reflections. All right, so there are nice, um, comprehensible pictures of the Coxeter group. Unfortunately, I can't draw you a nice, comprehensible picture of the Arden group. Why? Well, if I start reflecting across one of these lines, in the Coxeter group, that's order two. I just get it, I see one more triangle on the other side, and I can come back again. In the Arden group, it's infinite order. I would have infinitely many of these triangles branching out at each, over each edge, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, yes, it's something like this, but it's way more complicated, and it's not even locally finite, and it's crazy, all right? Um, but this is known as a, a Euclidean um, Arden group, but they are no longer easy to, to picture and to draw, okay? They're tricky. All right, so let's keep going. Um, okay. I want a geometric description of Arden groups. So how do I do that? Well, let's go back to this idea of the Coxeter group acting as reflection. It turns out that all Coxeter groups can be realized as reflection groups, actually on Rn, but I want to complexify it and think of them as now just, just tensor with C and make them reflections on, on complex end space, okay? So, um, I'll, and why is that? Well, it, the reason is that if I do that, then each of my reflections, so in, in my, in my um, picture before of the Euclidean one, if I, if I think of it as a reflection of R2, of the plane, then if I remove that hyperplane, the plane just falls apart. I have two disjoint components. But if I were to complexify it, then I'm removing a complex hyperplane, which is co-dimension two in, the real, in, in, in terms of real dimension. And what I, what I end up with is I haven't separated my space. I've created some fundamental group. I've created a hole. I'm, it's like removing a line from R3. I've created, you know, I've drilled, a, I've drilled a hole in my space, and I've created fundamental group, all right? OK, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at all the reflections, and we're going to remove the hyperplane, the complex hyperplane, fixed by each reflection. By the way, this first, uh, I think, arose in um, the study of singularity theory, where these hyperplanes represented certain singularities, and you want to remove the singularities. And anyway, these come up naturally in, in various places. So, so um, I want to define the hyperplane complement associated to this Coxeter group to be C, the um, complex end space with all these hyperplanes removed. Just cut them out, all right? Okay, uh, now what? Well, um, here's an example. Let's, let's just look at our, our symmetric group case, all right? Well, the symmetric group acts on complex end space just by permuting the coordinates, all right? And the reflections are switch two coordinates, switch the ith coordinate with the jth coordinate. That, that's a reflection, right? Just interchange two coordinates, all right? So the hyperplanes I need to remove are the sets of um, points in Cn in which the ith coordinate equals the jth coordinate, in which two coordinates are equal. Well, if I remove all of those hyperplanes, what do I have? I have n points in, in the complex plane where no two are equal, right? I'm back to my configuration space we talked about before. Remember, we wanted n points in our space where no two are allowed to be equal. Remember that for the robots to move around? Well, that's exactly what I get if I, if I remove these hyperplanes, all right? So the hyperplane complement is the analog of the configuration space, is, is what we what will play the role of the configuration space for us, all right, for in general. Um, and as we know, we already saw before that the braid group is just the fundamental group of this, well, up to, up to some modding out by the symmetric group. All right, well, it turns out 
this works for every art and group, um, good news. Um, it was a theorem of Vanderleck in, in the 80s that for any Coxler group whatsoever, if we look at, if we realize it as a reflection group and then remove the, um, the hyperplanes of the reflections, the fundamental group of that space is exactly the art and group. And in fact, that's where the interest in these groups first came from. People were studying these, these hyperplane complements and, and, and came up and realized that they had interesting, interesting fundamental groups. All right. Um, all right, we'll see what we see if I'm going to make it through this talk. But um, <laughs> all right, so um, it, it, so okay, so that's where that's our our geometric description of our group. We have presentation, and we have a description in terms of the fundamental group of, of this hyperplane complement. Okay, two descriptions. All right, um, it turns out that um, in some cases we actually could say a lot more, namely if. The Coxeter group is finite. By the way, I haven't come to this. So I'm going to talk about this in a minute. But Coxeter groups can be finite or infinite. Art and groups are always infinite. The, the generators are infinite order. You know, they're always infinite. But, uh, but Coxeter groups are sometimes finite and sometimes infinite. Like the, like the, um, the um, Euclidean one was infinite, for example, um, whereas the symmetric group is finite. But those other finite ones and infinite ones. Okay, so Deline in, the, in, this, in this early 70s proved that for finite Coxeter groups, not only is the fundamental group of the hyperplane complement equal to the Artin group, but in fact, this is a classifying space for the Artin group. What does that mean? Well, if you're not familiar with it, it, technically it means there's no higher homotopy groups, but intuitively it means it's just a topological picture of your group. It, it encodes topologically all, all the information about your group, and you can compute all sorts of things from a nice um, classifying space. All right, so, so, um, so Deline proved that if for finite coxeter groups, this, this hyperplane complement was really important in understanding, in understanding the art and group, and it really encoded everything we wanted to know about it. Okay, all right. So that brings us to. So any questions so far? That's our definitions. That brings us to what do we know and not know about art and groups? Why are these groups so interesting? Well, we divide art and groups into two classes, as I already mentioned before. But let's be let's give them names. Coxeter groups can be finite or infinite, whereas art and groups are always infinite, but we call them finite type or infinite type according to whether they're, they come from a finite or infinite Coxer group. All right, so we talk about finite type, or you can call them spherical type. I'm going to call them finite type. Finite type or infinite type according to what their Coxer groups look like. Okay. All right. <clears throat> well, it turns out that finite type art and groups are, are well understood. We know a ton about finite type art and groups, and that's mostly due not so much to geometric um, analysis of these things, but rather to a combinatorial structure called a Garside structure. It gives you really nice normal forms for words, and you can, it's, it's all algebraic, and you can compute everything um, um, algorithmically, there's solutions to the word problem, and we have we have great you know all these tools to work with um, for uh, to work with um, finite type um, art and groups. Um, infinite type ones, okay, this isn't quite true. Recently, it's been shown that the Euclidean ones can be given Garside structures, but most infinite type art and groups do not have anything like a Garside structure. We don't have good combinatorial tools to work with them. And as a result, um, there are a ton of really basic questions that we've been unable to answer about, about infinite type art and groups. So I'm going to tell you about some of those questions and then tell you about how we're finally using geometric group theory to make some progress on some of these questions. So what are some of the things we don't know? So now I'm going to focus on the infinite type. Okay, So for the finite type, no problem. But infinite type. What should we do? Okay, here's some open questions or conjectures or whatever. 
Um, the first one is, is very famous. It's known as the k pi 1 conjecture. And it says that just like for the finite case, these hyperplane complements should not only have fundamental group A gamma, they should be classifying spaces. They should be a k A gamma 1 spaces and tell us everything we need to know about, uh, about the group, all right? We think. We don't know. That's a conjecture, all right? Um, but the reason this conjecture has been so important is it turns out that once you can show that, you can answer tons of other questions about these. If we could show this were true. Um, in particular, I didn't say anything about this, but um, there's a very um, beautiful, explicit, finite um, cell complex, which is homotopy equivalent to this hyperplane complement. So once you know this is a k-pi-1 space, you have this beautiful k-pi-1 space you can work with and, and uh, you're in business, all right? So it'd be great if we could prove this, right? It'd be great if we could prove this. All right, the second one, does A, does, do, is there any torsion in these groups? No idea. Maybe, maybe not, we don't know, all right? Um, Third one is, do they have a central, you know, they have a central element. It turns out finite type Barton groups have a center, have a, have, have a non-trivial center. We think the infinite type ones don't have a center, but we don't really know, all right? Maybe, maybe not. Um, okay, um, word problem. What's the word problem? Well, you get, get given a, um, a, pre a presentation and, um, um, you want to know, you, 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 an element of the group can be represented as a product of the generators and their inverses, but there may be lots of different ways to represent it as, as words. And how can you tell whether two different words give the same, uh, represent the same element in your group? Well, you'd like to have an algorithm which would decide that. Well, we don't know, not only do we not have an algorithm, we don't even know if one exists. It's possible there is no algorithm that can tell you that. All right, so it's, it's unknown whether they have solvable word problems. Um, lots of other questions. For example, when can two different, it turns out it is possible that two different um, defining graphs, two different gammas give rise to isomorphic Artin groups. When does this happen? When does it not happen? Can you classify them? When, which ones are isomorphic and which ones aren't? Um, um, there's lots of questions which I can't really get into, but geometric group theorists are interested in when when groups act on spaces of negative curvature and we had our, do these things, we don't know. There's lots and lots of questions. I mean, I could go on all day about um, quest things we don't know about these groups, all right? So um, there we are. These, some of these problems have been around for a long time <laughs> and, and, and we really were getting nowhere. I mean, I worked on this back in the 1990s and after a while got stuck and said, I've had it with this, I'm going to go do something else. Um, but recently, there's been a lot of exciting new um, work going on. And so I've gotten back in, I've jumped back in and uh, gotten sucked into art and groups again. So, um, um, so that brings us to our, the last part of a, the talk. Yes, I think I'm doing okay. Um, which is how can we use geometry to try to address some of these questions, to get some information about some of these questions. All right, so let me tell you a little bit um, about geometric group theory. So the ideas in geometric group theory, as I said at the beginning of the talk, if you can get your group to act um, by isometry, is act as a symmetry group on some nice metric space, then you can use the geometry to learn about your group. So what's nice? Well, it, it, the, ones, the, the spaces that have been most useful in geometric group theory are ones which satisfy some kind of negative or non-positive curvature condition. Those tend to be the ones that have done the most for us. Well, what does that mean? Um, I'm not gonna give you formal um, definitions, um, um, but these were introduced by Gromoff. The original ones, the um, hyperbolic and cat zero, for example, are 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 the the uh, are defined in terms of the shapes of triangles. I mean, x can be. Um, it doesn't have to be a manifold. You know, usually curvatures associated with manifold. They don't have to be a manifold. It just has to be what's called a geodesic metric space, which means the distance between two points is the length of the minimal length of a, a path between them. So um, so he gave this very general definition of what it would mean to be non-positive curvature. And now there are some new versions of it, systolic, heli, all kinds of new um, um, ways of thinking of this non-positive curvature. And um, it turns out that if you have a space 
which has one of these conditions, you get immediately get all kinds of amazing things. So let me just give you one example that I'm going to refer to here um, in my applications. Um, cat zero. What's cat zero? Well, cat zero, I'm not going to give a formal definition, but basically cat zero says that if I draw a triangle in, in my space X, if I have a triangle made up of three geodesics in my space X, and I draw a triangle with the same edge lengths in the plane, that they want, the triangle in X should look at least as thin as the triangle in, in, in the plane. That triangles look thin. I'm not, okay, I can give you a formal definition of that later if you want it. But it, just pictorially, the triangles look thin. All right, so let's say I have a triangle like this. And now let's take our Y and our Z, and supposing I let them get closer and closer together and see what happens. All right, so I'm going to let one of these sides get shorter and shorter and shorter. Well, in the Euclidean plane, what's happening? Well, my triangle is getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and eventually it's going to converge to a single line. It's going to collapse down to a single line, right, in the Euclidean space. Well, my rule is that in X, my triangle has to be at least as thin as that. That means when I do the same thing in X, that triangle in X had better collapse down to a single line. And an immediate consequence of that is that any two points can, uh, are connected by a unique geodesic. Because if there were two different geodesics between these two points, then I could make a triangle that didn't collapse down to a single, down to, a, down to this single line, all right? So an immediate um, consequence of the, of the thin triangle condition is that given two points, there's a unique geodesic. Uh, uh, um, joining them. Once we have that, we can pick a base point and take, for any other point, we take the geodesic to the base point and slide that point down along that geodesic till it gets to the base point. And using this argument, we can prove that our space X is contractible. So I start with this condition the triangles are thin, and I conclude that my space is contractible. All right? That's pretty strong. That's a pretty strong conclusion from this um, non-positive curvature. All right, so that's an example, and we're going to use that. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's go back to our Artin groups, and I'm going to try and tell you now, um, um, give you some sort of concrete um, examples of how we've been using um, geometric group theory to answer questions. What are the spaces we're constructing, and how do we use the geometry to tell us something about these groups, OK? All right. OK, so um, all right, this, one's a, this part's a little more technical. I want to actually construct a space for you. All right, so if, if um, gamma is my defining graph. That is, it's, it's the thing that has the vertices of the generators, and the edges are labeled with the mijs to tell me what, you know, tell me what group A gamma is going to be. Now, supposing delta is some subgraph of that. That is to say it's some subset of the vertices together with whatever the edges were that we're connecting those vertices before. Full subgraph meaning I take any edges that connected those before and I use the same edges, all right? Okay, well, um, it turns out one can show, not surprisingly, I think, that, um, that the Artin group associated to delta injects into the Artin group associated to the full graph gamma. So I have these subgroups. They're called special subgroups of um, A gamma. Um, or sometimes very conjugates of special subgroups are called parabolic subgroups. So some people just call these parabolics, but I'll call, call them special subgroups, all right? Um, and I, I want to build a simplicial complex out of these, out of these. All right, so what's my simplicial complex? Well, first I'm going to take a um, partially ordered set, which consists of left cosets of these subgroups, of these um, special subgroups. So delta can be any subgraph here, and, and, and then I take any left coset of, of, of such a delta, okay, a set of all such things. And this is partially ordered by inclusion. So one coset contained in another coset, then those are related by, by this um, partial ordering. Okay, so um, I have a partially ordered set. How do you construct a space out of a partially ordered set? Well, there's something called a geometric realization of a partially ordered set. Uh, it's a simplicial complex. 
um, which consists of, so I'm gonna describe it, uh, we, call it, we call it the Artin complex in this particular case, but this can be done with any partially ordered set. So you've got this partially ordered set, you construct a simplicial complex whose vertices are the elements of your set. The edges connect any two vertex, vertices where one is less than the other, one is contained in the other. All right, so if, if one coset's contained in another, I connect it by an edge. And the simplest is you put them in wherever possible. That is, wherever I see a collection of vertices, all of which are con connected to each other by edges, that's called like a clique, I just fill in a simplex. I just fill that in, okay? Okay, that's a standard construction in, 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 in topology. It's called the geometric realization of the, of the partially ordered set. Um, Okay, now notice that um, if I, my Artin group acts on this set, remember I want an action on some geometric object. My Artin group acts on this set by left multiplication. That is, if I take a coset and I left multiply by an element of the Artin group, I get another coset, right? And if one is contained in another, it, they're still gonna be contained in each other after I multiply. So this, uh, this left multiplication gives me an action on this simplicial complex. All right, so now I have a simplicial complex and an action of A gamma on my simplicial complex. And I wanna know, is there some nice geometry here that I can use to learn something? All right, but before I do that, I wanna just say um, there, there are two other very, very closely related complexes that have played a, 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 a big role in this. So I just thought I'd throw them all in to, for you right now. So the one I just described, I called the Artin complex, this geometric realization of the, of the post set of of S gamma. Um, there are two others which I get by only allowing for certain cosets instead of allowing all cosets. So the clique complex, I only allow um, um, subgraphs that are cliques, meaning that are completely, every two, any two vertices are connected by an edge. I only allow delta if delta satisfies that property, that all of the uh, vertices are connected by edges. So it's a sub thing inside the Artin complex. And then the Deleen complex, this one's um, the most important but um, trickiest to understand. So for each delta, I have an Artin group, A delta, and I'm only gonna allow the ones where A delta is finite type. So my A gamma is infinite type. My A gamma, I'm only working with infinite type. But inside that, for example, if you take a single edge, that's always a finite type Artin group for a single edge. So inside this infinite type one, there are tons of finite type ones. So I'm only going to allow, for the Deleen complex, I'm gonna insist that they be, that they be um, finite type. Okay, so they're all similar. It's just that um, the Artin complex is the biggest, and then there's the clique complex, and then there's the Deleen complex. They're sub, they're sub things, okay? Okay, what should we do with these? How am I doing on time? Yeah, I can get through this. Um, okay, so here's some applications that we've used. These, these three um, constructions have proved to be extremely useful in understanding A gamma. All right, so here's the first one. This goes actually back to the 90s. Um, uh, Mike, Mike Davis and I um, studied, we, were, we introduced and studied the Deleen complex. And what we showed about the Deleen complex is that the Deleen complex is always um, homotopy equivalent to that hyperplane complement, always, all right? Um, that means that to prove the k-pi-1 conjecture, what we want to do is show that, um, that the, I'm sorry, the link complement is homotopy equivalent to the universal cover of the hyperplane complement, not the hyperplane complement itself, the universal cover. So if, if, if in order to show that, that, you know, that the um, hyperplane complement is a k pi one space, its universal cover needs to be contractible. It's an if and only if. We wanna have no higher homotopy groups. So that's what we need to show. Well, what, 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 we, be, what our theorem says is that that k pi one conjecture that I said was really important, that's gonna hold if and only if the Deleen complex is contractible, all right? So how do we prove the Boolean complex is contractible? Well, how about showing it has a cat zero metric, right? I gave you a proof that if something has a cat zero metric, it's automatically contractible. So what we, we did is we defined a metric, well, a couple of metrics actually, on D gamma and conjectured that they should be contractible. 
We were able to show it in certain cases. We cannot show it in all cases. But since then, a lot of people have worked on this. There's been real progress on it. We still don't know it for all art and groups, but we know it for an increasing number of art and groups have been shown, have been able to show that this complex is cat zero, therefore contractible, therefore the K pi one conjecture holds. Okay, so using the geometry to show that, that this K pi one conjecture holds. All right, still open in general. Um, yeah, so the, the um, conjecture has been shown to hold for various classes of infinite type art and groups. Um, and, and, and not only that, once we know that's true, we can prove pretty much all the other conjectures. Okay, so that's really great when we can do it. Okay, that's one uh, result. Um, uh, here's another one. Um, it, it, using the clique cube complex, it turns out the clique cube complex is always cat zero. So you might say, oh great, we're done. Well, we're not done, because uh, the clique cube complex is not homotopy equivalent to the hyperplane complement, all right? So what can we do with it? Well, um, there's been a bunch of work, um, in particular some work by Ellison Skolberg and Goodell in Paris, that have been able to use the cat zero-ness of this complex to say that if we knew that our conjectures, whatever conjecture we're trying to prove, basically any one of the conjectures, if it holds for the stabilizers of vertices, then it holds for the whole thing. Well, the stabilizers of vertices are special subgroups or conjugates of special subgroups. So what it does is it says that if one of the conjectures holds for cliques, for graphs that are cliques, then it holds for all graphs. So if we could prove that it holds for these very special types of graphs, then we would know that it holds for everything. All right, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, um, I'm, I'm basically done here. Um, so I, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but people have been using recently using the Artin complex, the full Artin complex, to study isomorphisms and automorphisms of, of, of um, A gammas. They've got some really nice results on that. Mar um, Alexander Martin and Vascu, um, and also um, to study properties of um, um, parabolic subgroups and their intersections. And the reason we care about those is that there's a proposed complex which would function as the curve complex for a mapping class group. It would have the, it would have the, we would be able to use it like a curve complex if we could show these various um, properties hold. So people have been working on that. And there's lots more. Yeah, it goes on and on. There's all kinds of interesting work going on in this area. So I don't have time for any more, but um, I just feel like um, after you know a long period of sort of being stuck, that this field has just absolutely taken off and I'm having a good time with it. And so thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much. I think we have a couple minutes for a few questions and if you want to go up to one of the microphones, there's one over here and another one on the other side. Go ahead. Hello, oh, uh, thank you for the really interesting talk. Uh, I had a question about, uh, so one of your conjectures is that you took the Dillian complex and you constructed a metric on it and you, in some cases, you can prove that it's cat zero. So proving that it's cat zero means understanding the geodesics on this space very, uh, 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 understanding quite completely what the geodesics are. And so I'm wondering uh, what the geodesics are on these Dillian complexes. They must have some relation to the algebra uh, and uh, yes, uh, how are the algebraic information encoded inside these geodesics? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that because we don't think in terms of the algebraic, that's not the way we describe geodesics. Geodesics, um, it, 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 basically it's a local property, as long as in a cat zero space anyway, if you can, you know, it's sort of locally geodesic, they are geodesic. So you, you need to, um, Oh, yeah, how do they reflect the, yeah, so there are a number of things. First of all, what I didn't tell you is that there's two different um, um, geometries that we've looked at. One is, um, is a cubical geometry, and for cubical geometries, where we, we think of it instead of as a simplicial complex as a cube complex, for those, it's a purely combinatorial um, question. 
And that, that is algebraic in a sense. And in that case, we can answer exactly when that particular metric is cat zero and when it's not, um, because it's a purely combinatorial uh, thing you have to check. Um, but in the cases where that metric is not cat zero, we have another metric called the Musang metric that we think will always be cat zero. And that's much trickier. I mean, you can sort of look at what the geodesics in the, um, you project down to the um, Coxer complex, and we understand what geodesics down there look like, and you sort of need to understand the relation. It's not an algebraic um, description, really, what a geodesic is, but interesting question. Thank you. Okay, so um, I would like to enjoy, uh, invite anyone who would like to talk to Ruth one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, she'll be in room 204, which is just two doors down for the next 15 minutes or so to answer any further questions that you have. And then before then, please join me in thanking her for a wonderful talk and all her service for the AMS.